here, here at Baker Central uh, 667 Young Street on the second floor for part of the Karma Cup Speaker Series. We're at Baker Central 2018 Karma Cup Speaker Series. Hello, Vapor Central. Welcome back to the Karma Cup Speaker Series. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting our next speaker just about five minutes ago and kind of getting into his origin story and kind of what he does now and how he supports the cannabis industry and the cannabis community is really interesting. Um, so up next, we have Scott Wilkins. Um, his expertise is actually in, uh, in insurance. So um, Scott, you have the stage. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. And, and this is on, yes, thank you. And uh, so I'd like to uh, thank everybody here for, for coming out as well as everybody watching as well. Um, it's been an amazing event. My, my name is uh, Scott Wilkins and uh, I work with a company called LMG Insurance and we um, have been insuring uh, cannabis growers for, uh, well, about 10 years, since 2008. Uh, we uh, attended the first trade show which was called um, Treating Yourself here in Toronto, and I was actually sitting in Vapor Lounge eight years ago right there with Remo and Matt Murnau, and Matt Murnau showed us a rig that had dabs for the very first time. Knew, What's that crystal nail? I can remember this place great. So I'm glad to be back. Um, but uh, one of the things that um, I wanted to, to sort of touch on is the uh, event organizers. Thanks for having me, and, and uh, Sarah's done a great job at, at uh, getting everything all together as well as um, uh, organizing the speakers here. So. Uh, I've worked with them for three years, but this is my first time actually coming out to attend the event, and I'm really happy I, I took the effort to come out. I had a gas yesterday. We're going to head down and, and watch the judging later, and um, it's going to be amazing. So I'd like to thank everybody there and, and um, you know, get into my talk now, I guess, at that point. Um, oh, I guess cannabis and insurance. It's one of those things where uh, it's always been a question mark. Even when you're legal, you're afraid to bring it up because you're dealing with banks and academics who uh, have that stigma that we all know so well. Um, so what happened with me is um, my background, a bit of my background is I, uh, I have a very, I have ADD, harsh, and it's given me this incredible analytical skill. So I'm a, a, a high risk insurance agent, meaning high hard to place risks were my specialties. And about uh, nine years ago, I had a guy approach me who had uh, a lease that was w requiring insurance. He had a license and he wanted to grow in this warehouse and nobody would talk to him. Um, I had no insurance policies in the cannabis space at that time, but I enjoyed cannabis as well. Uh, I live on Vancouver Island and have been there for many, many years. So um, lots of people that I know, uh, it's, it's part of the culture there and I have... Uh, uh, I've been to people's homes, I know they don't burn down, all this stuff, so I thought I'd give it a try. And uh, I approached almost every insurer in Canada, and this has been my story. I found an underwriter who had somebody in the family that had glaucoma that this helped. So it's a little crack. We stick our foot in and we pry the shit out of the door, and I wrote my first policy. And um, that was you know, uh, something that was impressive. Then we came out to the, the 2008 show here, and then we went back to uh, BC and started to write insurance policies. And um, we ended up with quite a few. And like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're dealing with over 1,000 policies now. Uh, the ACMPR, which is like the old MMAR, is still moving forward. But what happened is I wanted to sort of brief a bit about the, the regula regulatory history as well, meaning when I got involved in this to help out these guys, there was no commercial production, there was nothing. There was just this rumor about um, uh, ACMPR that might be coming. So we started the program and, and, and started rolling it along. And then, of course, they announced the ACMPR and that they were going to shut down the um, MMAR program. And we all know what happened there is the uh, Allard case came up. And uh, I was actually quite fortunate to be asked to participate. And uh, I was one of the expert witnesses in the Allard case. And uh, I was a rebuttal to... Uh, Shane Holmquist and uh, the RCMP, and uh, also uh, forget the Surrey, Surrey Fire Chief's name, but um, they didn't have much evidence, and I was the only guy at the time. I had over 300 insurance policies. We had no claims on these things. I had all this amazing academic data that nobody could see. John Conroy and Kirk Tusa approached me, and next thing you know, I participated in the Aller trial, and um, I had a great time. It was great. We won. And, uh, but during that process, they invented the ACMPR, which is the last regulatory uh, framework that we're dealing with at this moment, which is, 
okay, we'll reinvent the uh, home growers and we'll let them do it under uh, the part two of the ACMPR. So basically we're back to where we were before the program ended with two programs running parallel and we're about to retail. So um, there's a lot of challenges going on in, in, in that space when it comes to uh, trying to uh, you know, develop a business plan, uh, you know, the, the regulatory change, it, it keeps on happening and happening. So you're pushing around one direction and then all of a sudden everything changes on you and you have to sort of focus on, uh, on something else. Um, so I want to look at my notes here real quick. Um, so with the, excuse me, with the uh, MMPR, uh, they were trying to get rid of the home growers and uh, the designated growers. But prior to that, when there was no such thing as um, uh, the, the commercial, we would insure uh, homeowners, people who are renting uh, 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 outbuildings on people's properties, basically any type of scenario where people could set up a legal MMAR license, whether it's on commercial property, residential property, all that, we were able to su supply a solution. Um, the pricing was, was a little tough, but uh, not unaffordable. And um, you know, as we move on, we're, you know, the pricing has come down, the coverages have come up, and we're sitting on the cusp of um, uh, the economy of scales, what I call it, meaning we have all this policy, all this premium, um, amazing loss ratios where we're going to say soon, we're going to approach some special insurers and say, we want these rates, this is the business we can give you. And hopefully somebody, a mainstream company, not the guys that I've been having to deal with, Lloyd's and uh, non-mainstream companies for this, I'd like to see a mainstream person jump up and, uh, and take this on with respect to uh, the economy of scales and all that. But we're, we're not there yet, we're almost there, which means the pricing will come down to what normal insurance should cost, maybe with a cannabis endorsement or something like that. <coughs> Excuse me, instead of the way we do it now. But we do it now because people do it in their homes. Um, uh, you know, they, they owe money on their homes. Uh, you know, you, you, one of the problems with the Health Canada program initially is they gave you all the information how to set up. You set up and then you call your insurance agent and then you get cancelled. Or, you, you know, you don't tell your insurance company. And that's the situation where um, it, it doesn't, doesn't bode well for anybody who's doing cannabis because they think you're hiding. Uh, but what you're really doing is just trying to do what you need to do for your medicine, but not get in trouble because of the stigma and the insurance you don't understand. But now there are people out there. I'm not the only guy doing this as well. There's, there's insurance people that are doing it all over, but uh, I think I'm the best. I'll, I'll add that. Um, I also am an expert on the uh, other side of the fence, the LPs, meaning during the process when the MMPR came through, two of my uh, MMPR growers successfully transferred into that group of the first LPs that were approved. And um, so as a result, I had to learn quickly um, how to set up the insurance policies for them with respect to commercial risks and the ability to sell product to many people where now you're into product liability and a whole bunch of other things as well. So um, in that regard, uh, we ended up going forward with the two LPs that we had. And uh, at present, I worked with about nine of them um, and about 30 of them that are about to pop sort of thing. Lots and lots of stuff going on in, uh, in that area. And that also brings us more to this sort of demographic, which is the uh, micro uh, LP licenses that, you know, everybody's talking about, we're waiting to hear about. And, um, you know, I, I'm working with the Craft Cannabis Association of British Columbia because that's where I'm from, but we're trying to uh, get more information on this so we can start to, uh, get some of these, the, the amazing skill, like everybody who is at this uh, show that Sarah puts on every year, they need to be involved in the production of cannabis. There's so much skill and ability and at present there's no regulatory framework that allows them to participate into the future. So it would be a shame if we lost all that um, good labor and skill and all that. So uh, hopefully the micro LP when it does come out will allow a lot of smaller businesses uh, to start up um, and allow uh, some of the people who have been in this business for many, many years, um, whether it's gray or whatever, to uh, participate, which is, which is what we like. Um, from a, a market perspective, I, I don't think we've reached the end. Uh, nobody really knows how much cannabis is going to be sold, but um, I, I honestly think we're, we're nowhere near the production ability that we're supposed to have. So um, when the retail does come, uh, what we see in five years from now is going to be totally different than, than what's happening now. And I'm working with the LPs who are stocking and selling 
hundreds of thousands of grams right now to all the government stores. And uh, there's two sort of land, land uh, uh, scapes with this. There's a private store that uh, some provinces and some uh, uh, areas are going to allow. And, and they're going to be able to buy product from the LPs and all that. They're going to have some insurance requirements and that. But when you deal with the government stores, and I've already dealt with them, they have very specific requirements. If I'm an LP and I want to sell to the LCO, uh, LCBO, um, I need $25 million worth of liability insurance first, right? Uh, there's been some cases, we got class action stuff, where uh, uh, it's been very expensive. So the LCBO being a, a, a person that touches it and, and resells it, they will vicariously be involved in those lawsuits. So they say, no, 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 pump the liability up and we're going to be okay. So that's expensive. Um, the other thing is the excise tax, meaning the way tobacco, uh, alcohol, and now cannabis is sold to... <laughs> yes, in tax. It, uh, it, it has a built-in tax that is totally different than uh, a sales tax, and in, in that uh, that's, gets charged on a POS system, meaning it's part of the product cost. So as a result of that, when um, you are doing that as an LP, you require to have a bond, uh, an excise tax bond put in place for the tax portion. I'll give you an example. I've had a request for a bond for um, $3 million, which isn't a big deal. Uh, that's the, the dollar a gram. That, that would cover $3 million worth of uh, $1 a grams. And the same thing, I've had one for $25 million as well. And, and a bond gets put up in place and stays there because the insurance company won't pay tax, meaning if you lose your truck of cannabis, tobacco, or alcohol, it's the same thing. The insurance company pays for the portion that's not tax, and then you need to go to your bond and collect the portion uh, that is tax, so you have full indemnity. So that's, that's another way they're doing But the cost of a bond for $25 million is, is not, not cheap, um, but it's always coming down with respect to um, you know, the volume that's coming and, and whatnot. So it's, it's happening in that regard, and it's been happening for months now, we've been working on this stuff. So they're trying to get ready, and most of them are going to be there. Most of them are going to be there on uh, October 17th. Um, so what we're left with is a program here in, in Canada that will allow Canadians to grow plants at home, four plants if you're non-medical. Everybody says, what's going to happen to medical? But I see the statistics of the ACMPR. There's two to 3,000 people signing up a month to, to grow their own medicine. So I, I don't, plus the MMAR, plus the ones that have already signed, there's probably 35,000 or 40,000 Canadians right now uh, growing their own uh, cannabis at home for medical purposes. And with this talk about people saying, what's going to happen to medical after recreation? You know, let's get rid of it. And, you know, if you want to try it, you can just go down to the store and buy a gram and try it. Well, that's um, a big reverse. I don't think that they're going to do that. They might try to do it, but um, any Canadian that requires more than four plants for medical purposes, I think it's been established over and over and over again in court. Um, so it'd be hard for people to um, change the, uh, you know, change the, the home growing portion of this. Now, um, the plant counts and, and you know that sort of stuff might might be altered, but uh, as far as the ability to grow more than four under medical, I don't think that's going to go anywhere. And that's been my business plan. I'm strictly looking at the medical. The recreational came along on this side, and, and just by association, I'm busy there, but I'm, my business plan hasn't changed. I, I'm counting on them not changing the MM, uh, the ACMPR, or getting rid of the, the fact that you can grow your own medicine. But we are just a lawsuit away from everything, I believe. Um, they've tried many times to do things. As a matter of fact, I always found it quite uh, interesting that the architecture of these programs are are built on lawsuits, meaning I put it out like this and then this lawsuit makes it do that. And so you're ended up with more or less a, a bastardized version of, of a regulation that um, has been pushed, right? So you, you don't end up with a, a, an absolute perfect one, but um, that is what is good about Canada, meaning if they try to do that again in the future, I'm fairly certain there's enough resources around in, in the cannabis community to probably take them to task like they did with Allard. But um, we'll see, we don't know. Um, so the, the, both the programs are up and running now, medical and also the uh, recreational stuff. And uh, we're also dealing with many, many, many ancillary businesses as well, meaning uh, you go to a trade show now, and I mean, everybody's got branding, uh, everybody's supporting the growers with the machinery. It's, it's a massive um, uh, economic push. 
uh, and, and it's a great opportunity in the sense for anybody who uh, has um, you know, certain businesses and, and technology that they could just tweak over and now access the cannabis producers markets as well and uh, specialize in that. It's, it's um, uh, you know, for business people, it's an economic boom and um, you know, the smart ones and the people who jump on the, the bandwagons and do the right thing are gonna you know, be the, the captains of our industry as we move, move forward. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm here for insurance, so I just did need to talk a bit about some of the policy details. Uh, you know, insurance is uh, one dry notch above accounting. I hope I haven't offended any accountants. But um, one of the things about it is it's boring, but I like to try to make it a little exciting. But I'm insuring cannabis, so I think it is. Uh, but the way an insurance policy works in general is, is it's an all-risk policy subject to policy exclusions, meaning everything's covered except what they exclude. And they'll exclude you know, common sense things like uh, intentional acts, um, uh, you know, normal things. There's not very many exclusions. So if uh, I drop a plate of hot uh, enchiladas on my uh, you know, $3,000 collected rug, as long as there's not a, an enchilada dropping exclusion, I'm covered. So it's a pretty broad setup in that regard, and, and the policies are also uh, a contractual agreement subject to meeting the conditions for the payout, which if any of my clients don't have a problem in their insurance policy and they have a claim, that means we push hard for payment um, right away because the policy is correct. Often the delay uh, in, in the insurance adjusting process is because there's confusion on how the policy was written, the wordings may not have applied, uh, the adjusters are always trying to figure out a way to save the insurance company money. I, I'm involved with all my claims. I don't let any of that go on. Uh, I know the wordings as good as the underwriters and the adjusters, and um, so as a result, um, you know, we, we don't have many denied claims in that regard, but uh, this class of business doesn't have a lot of claims either. Um, we, uh, in, in the insurance industry, we measure profitability with uh, what we call a loss ratio. And a loss ratio means if, if I'm running a 100% loss ratio, every dollar I've taken in, I've put out in a claim. So that sucks. You don't want to have to run a, a loss ratio at 100% because uh, you got to start pumping rates up right away. Um, so on average, homeowners insurance, like very profitable stuff for insurance companies, cookie cutter car, uh, they're running an acceptable loss ratio is up to 30% in most cases. Um, you know, and then they work to try to get it down. And cannabis, I have 10 years of data. I have recorded all my claims. 6% loss ratio. Six, I'll say it again. 6% loss, better than any class of business we have. Two reasons for that. The way we select our risks, we don't select bad ones, meaning... If you don't have the electrical done correctly, we stop. I know electricians in your area that are green friendly. If you want, they'll come and look. They'll bring you back up to speed. Then you and I can continue, right? We, we try not to write bad risks in that regard. So we are also bringing some of the people up in, in, in that way. But uh, it's just um, something that, you know, we, we need to sort of approach and make sure we do it right. Um, oh. So we're talking about the policy details, um, the all risk and all that. But we, if you're a commercial setup where you're, uh, you know, running a commercial business, you, you don't need the the homeowner style coverages. You're more of a, a commercial exposure. And as it sits, we also insure dispensaries, and we have about 36 of them insured across Canada, and they're illegal. And people wonder how do we do it, and um, uh, we do it because I agreed. Uh, got the underwriters to agree that we're not insuring illegal activity, uh, let alone they have huge exclusions for illegal activity anyways. What we're after is this guy who wants to run a business, who has a license or applied for a license through Vancouver or whatever, um, he, he shows that he's got a lease and there's a requirement for insurance, and, and I convinced the underwriters that we're, we're insuring a slip and trip, we're insuring his POS system, we're insuring uh, liability for, for people walking in and out of the store, um, it's not about insuring the cannabis or the, any illegal activity, let alone uh, the medical process to, to become a member and all that. So um, I insured my first dispensary about uh, four and a half years ago uh, on that basis. And then, of course, we, we've gone from there. Um, then we got into vapor lounges. And I don't know how it works out here in Toronto, but I work with a few 
in, uh, in British Columbia, and I'm working with the underwriters in London, and, and they're like, well, well how, do you, how do you deal with um, over-serving, uh, intoxication? And I'm like, well, you don't really get intoxicated, you know, and I'm sending them all these links on, you just sleep on the couch, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about anything, and it's not really like alcohol. And through the process, I educated him to the point where what he cared about was what happens if a big guy fell on a lady that was small, and then there's a liability issue, right? Um, so, uh, you know, in the end, we were able to, to ensure our very first vapor lounge, and one of the requirements was uh, a sign-in process and a sign-out process, and, and so I advanced that to anybody who wanted to open one of these and, and uh, allowing them to get insured. So we were able to, to do that, and we insure a lot of those uh, <coughs> businesses as well, but it's, it's not, we're not insuring the illegal activity. Uh, there is nothing to insure uh, if there is illegal activity, but it's, it's not a risk from an insurance point of view, and, and I'm able to communicate that to the underwriter, so it's been working out for me. Um, when we get into more of the, the commercial end of coverages, um, uh, a micro LP is going to have the same exposures as, a, as an LP, meaning product liability. If you're selling something to people, uh, you're going to be taken to task if you fuck up, and you... Uh, sell bad product and, and it's the same whether you're, you're a micro LP or not and, and some of the coverages and, and stuff that we've been able to establish um, for, for you know what I'm calling craft uh, biological asset coverage well, what's that uh, biological assets growing plants um, you know you want to make sure that you know that's your bread and butter and if you had a, an issue and you lost your crop that you're able to uh, somehow regain financial um, uh, indemnity from it. Now, a lot of the times I put this coverage on a crop because it's a contractual requirement, meaning somebody's putting money in, somebody's doing something, and they say, we'll do it, but you need to buy this insurance, you need to buy that insurance to protect my investment and the money that I'm lending you for your business. Um, so biological assets, if you're worried about it, we can insure it, but most of the time it becomes, you can manage that with risk management, like most people uh, you know, you don't leave your grow room that much. Uh, you know, you, you have safety switches. There's many, many redundant things you can do before you actually have to buy biological asset coverage. Um, and that's one of the things that I explore with the clients as well from a, uh, an exposure point of view. Like, where do you need to buy insurance? And where do you need to self-insure? And how will it affect your premium? So things that are, are, are hard to recover from financially, we use a, a risk matrix to sort of point them out so that people understand and anything that's hard to recover from financial, we just throw it into insurance. It's not anything else, it's just a, a cost of doing business. Everything else I risk manage and will cover myself, right? And then we move on from there. Um, so if you need product coverage for your product, it used to be in a vault or wherever you store, we can uh, cover, um, what is it, uh, dried, dried bud, drying bud, uh, growing plants, uh, and now oils as well too. So. Um, obviously for only the LPs, but instantly when the micro LPs come out as well. Um, labs, people who are doing uh, uh, lab work and whatnot, they have a uh, huge exposure in errors and emissions, but labs have always been the same. It's just now that they're looking more on, on the cannabis end of things. So um, I've been uh, fortunate enough to work with a few of the well-known labs that work with the LPs and put together their policies. And um, we're looking at, the biggest thing with them is an errors and emissions policy, meaning if they make an error and emission, in one of their tests, and then you go ahead and do something, and it causes you financial destruction because they were wrong, they can get the coverage. And, and errors and emissions isn't covered on liability, product liability. It's a standalone coverage that you need if you're that type of a risk. You wouldn't need errors and emissions if you were a vapor lounge, that type of thing. Um, and then also we look at uh, a, you know standard business interruption stuff, meaning um, you know most businesses are running with a certain amount of cash flow and they have insurance to replace all the stuff in here so the place burns down and it takes six months and they're rebuilt. Well, what happened in the last six months? You know, you lost all your staff. Uh, you may not have been able to pay fixed, fixed expenses. Um, it, it could be a real drag. It can literally uh, make you dry up and blow away even though you had an insurance policy. So um, we explore business interruption with clients, meaning Okay, well, what would happen if this happened? How would you feel? And, and go through the process. And we could actually ensure the revenues, um, uh, the trend that you've been going through, uh, key personnel, like if you work with uh, a manager that you cannot replace because they're the, you can actually cover their salary. So, so for the six months that you're being rebuilt, they're getting full strokes. 
and you, you're guaranteed to get them back. Um, so that, that's a very, very important coverage as well. Uh, and, and one of the things that we also like to do is we approach, I, I don't have just one insurance market anymore that does the cannabis, we have about five. So if you're a licensed producer and a future micro LP guy, we can get about four different product liability quotes and, and each one is different and each one may or may not be right for the client. And so that's the level of, of, uh, of work and, and, and analytical process that we have to go through to make sure that we're tying the right coverages to the right risks. And, um, you know, on, on top of it all, this is new territory when it does come to lawsuits, meaning, um, you know, if you have a big product recall and uh, somebody starts a lawsuit, nobody really knows where it's going to end and where it's going to start because there's been no real um, uh, history on it. So uh, that's why they're asking for $25 million limits and, and all this other stuff so that they can have enough in the bank, so to speak, should, uh, should it get a little out of control. Um, so that's, you know, the, the type of area that we're working in. And um, uh, uh, nowhere I need to, so where, where are we going, I guess? Where is medical going? We talked about that. Uh, I mentioned five years from now, it's going to be a whole different scenario. Um, and one thing I just wanted to quickly talk about was uh, one of the reasons why I'm here and why uh, I'm so knowledgeable with the crowd and all that stuff is um, about a year after I started the program, uh, I had to get a, a, an operation for a C6, C7 spinal cord fusion because of a car accident that happened before I started. I was just dealing with it and then they discovered that I needed this operation. And, I had so much nerve pain and all this stuff, and it was absolutely outrageous. Gabapentin, the maximum amounts. I had T3s just to sleep. And uh, one, my, my very first customer, the guy who brought me the lease and all that stuff, who is actually an LP today, um, everybody who can remember those Da Vinci uh, uh, vaporizers that ran on butane. Well, I, I had a, a halo on for 90 days, and I'm lying at my mom's place, and he shows up with, with this, right? And... Uh, I was terrified of coughing with, with a halo on, but I ended up coughing. It didn't matter. Um, but that started me getting away from gabapentin. And, and so here I was in the insurance industry working with this crowd, and all of a sudden I had this neck, neck thing that freaked me out. And I have kids. Uh, you know, I, I want to be there for the family and all that stuff, and it was really bad. I, had, uh, uh, I built a, a two-by-four system that allowed me to sleep on a, a reclining chair, if I had it under my arm, pushed up, relieving the nerve pain. That was the only fucking way I could sleep. So uh, once the operation happened, it took that away, but I still had tons and tons of residual issues, and I could not sleep, and it would cause me all kinds of problems unless I had mega pharmaceuticals. But I remembered cannabis put me to sleep all the time when I was a kid. That's why I got away from it for a while. And um, so <clears throat> I went through the process of becoming a patient myself, and uh, growing as well, I uh, found a strain that works really good for me. Um, I make oils. I uh, use Bud for night to put me to sleep. Um, but I'm an insurance agent uh, that has a license and, um, uh, to, to sell insurance. And I was quite concerned about that becoming public knowledge. But I'm sitting here talking about it because uh, it doesn't matter. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Is, uh, when I was um, uh, tapped to be the uh, uh, expert witness on the Allard case about... Two weeks before the case, John Conroy called me and said, uh, I got some bad news. And uh, he said, the Canada has gone into your medical records and has found out that you are a cannabis grower and a cannabis patient. And they have announced that they're going to introduce it into the evidence of the Allard case to try to uh, um, you know, disrupt my, my, uh, my evidence. So that was pretty huge. And it's like, can they do that? You know? And, uh, he didn't think they could, but the next day uh, we had a conference call and they said, you know, they can, you know, and I guess if you sue Canada, they can do whatever they want. And um, so I was really concerned. I, I had dinner with John and I was saying, um, my concern is I'm an insurance agent with a license. I, I go through this, I'm outed, so to speak, and then I have a competitor who doesn't like me for whatever reason, says, to the insurance council, do you, you like stoned insurance agents running around or whatever? Who knows? I didn't think it was a big deal, but I was concerned because I had no knowledge. And um, John and uh, Bebas Vase and uh, Kirk were at the table, and they all looked at me and they said, if that happens, you have us pro bono to the Supreme Court of Canada. So I figured that was a bit of a comment. I said, okay, let's take it on. Let's do it. And uh, I sat on the stand, 
and they, they brought it out, and it didn't make a difference. It made them look like an idiot. So, um, so there you go. That, that, was, that was just a, a quick side story on, on how I'm sort of tied in. You know, I'm an insurance guy, but really, I'm, I'm a cannabis lover, right? And um, it just so happens that I'm an insurance guy as well, and I'm really good at what I do. And the people that work with me don't let the idea that I'm uh, so involved in the community uh, become a problem. As a matter of fact, it's an advantage for them and their policies as well, because we know a little bit more than most of the brokers. And um, what makes underwriters comfortable with risks is when a broker can impart correctly to them so they can look on a piece of paper, wow, I understand this risk. Uh, Scott understands this risk. I'm getting some good rates. Other brokers put together stuff they don't quite understand, and, and the underwriters look at it and say, I don't think he understands. What kind of rates is he going to get? Not the same rates. So that's another value added for working with us as well. Um, we're total students of the industry. We won't stop learning, even though we almost know it all. Um, so I don't know how are we on time, by the way. Ten minutes, okay. Um, I could. Uh, there's not a lot of people here live, but I know there's probably more people watching. Uh, is there any questions? I thought I might ask if anybody here might have a, a question. If anybody is concerning, no. How about a joint? Yeah, does anybody have a joint <laughs> and a lighter? <laughs> Throw me a joint. Um, so, uh, you know, I just wanted to show up and, and, and let everybody know that this is out there. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I feel like uh, Elon Musk. Is this going to fuck me? <laughs> no. Oh, my God, I'm terribly sorry. I, I just, somebody just gave that to me. <laughs> you hate to be that guy, and uh, I'm that guy as well. There, let me do that. <laughs> it's just for insurance purposes. Yes, I'm totally sorry. <laughs> okay, does anybody have a volcano bag? Let me, uh, no, no, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, for British Columbia, you know, I think we can smoke joints in our vapor lounges. I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> that was funny. Uh, so, I, I guess in general, it's been a bit of a journey, and, and uh, I started doing this by myself, and, and the firm that I worked for, Again, it took that little crack for the owner to say, okay, let's do it because there's going to be people that are going to not like dealing with us because we're, we're with cannabis. But we did lose some business, but we replaced it with so much more. It just doesn't matter. Um, uh, but that's what it took with somebody, again, just to say, okay. And uh, today I work with a staff of over four people um, that are all, and all we do all day long, nine to five, in our insurance office with five people is, is deal with insurance revolving around cannabis and uh, that sort of stuff. So it's, it's quite a, a, a neat scenario in that regard. And if there are any um, cannabis insurance agents out there who are looking for good work, um, I would love to, to meet you. It's hard to turn an insurance person into a cannabis insurance person, but if you're, I'd, I'd like to say, take a cannabis person, turn them into insurance agent. But anyways, we're always looking for people who uh, are interested in this class of business and we have great opportunity as well. Um, for, for growth and that sort of stuff. So um, on that, I think that might be it, unless there's anything else that uh, you know, anybody might have a question about. I'm oh, no, I was going to read out the coverages, but that's fine. I, I'll, I'll, I'll throw out a link or something like that if, if at the bottom of the page on YouTube or something, if we could do that. Sure. Well, My website is uh, mmip.ca, um, medical marijuana insurance program.ca, mmip.ca. Um, and for fun, Google my name with the word affidavit next to it, and you can read, uh, read about the uh, Allard case. It's, it's quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So for, for those who don't know, the Allard case is essentially um, the court case that allowed uh, medicinal cannabis patients to maintain their right to grow and produce their own cannabis. Um, this man's expert testimony attributed to being able to maintain that. The judge um, wrote my name in the decision, actually. Exactly. Yeah. So um, if you do Google Scott Wilkins affidavit, it's, 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 it's long, but it's really good. A lot of pictures. Don't, don't let the 46 <laughs> pages intimidate you. Um, but, but with that being said, um, it was essentially that court case that, that, that proved that growing cannabis at home is essentially safe um, and that people should be allowed to do it. And uh, hopefully come October 17th, y'all are going to grow your own four plants at home. So thank you, Scott, and thank uh, you. we'll see you again. Thank you, people.
Also, if you're anywhere near Toronto, come on down to Vapor Central here for today and tomorrow. More speakers tomorrow.